Ultimately, it all comes back to time because time is the resource that we're born with a certain amount of that we can't restore. You know, whereas if you lose money, you can get money back. If you spend it, you can get some more of it. It comes back to time, but the translator is always money. Hey there, I am Dr. Jason Ballara, and this is the Know Your Why podcast, where we explore the why behind success. Every week, I meet with real estate investors, veterinary entrepreneurs, mindset coaches, authors, and fitness professionals to uncover their why and how it drives them on the winding road to success. What is your why? Hi, everyone. I'm Jason Ballara, and this is the Know Your Why podcast. Today, I'm here with Ben Utley. Ben is a CFP. He not only serves as the service team leader at Physician Family Financial Advisors, but also co-hosts their podcast of the same name. Um, well recognized for his expertise, which we're going to dive into. Ben has been featured in New York Times and listed among the 150 best financial advisors for doctors. Um, ben, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you for for taking the time out. Um, I really do appreciate you being here. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's start, and we 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 talked about this before we started recording, but, but let's just start with your story, your background, and. Uh, We'll kind of dive into um, some of the some of the things that you've discovered and in, in, in your what you know how you approach things with your clients and everything. But before just first, just want to hear about you and, and um, your story. Oh, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you a story about me that's gonna be a little bit different. I'm gonna tell you about uh, an event that happened in my childhood that informs who I am today. So uh, I'm a native Texan, but I've been living in Oregon for 30 years. I'm in my 50s. I got a couple of kids. I've been married to my first wife forever. I met her in college, right? But I grew up in Texas in the suburbs. And the place I grew up is kind of a rich area now, but at that time it was a very solidly middle class. And uh, being in Texas, you know, sometimes they have festivals there. And the festival that uh, I'm going to talk about was a country fair. And so the country fair was was held on some fairgrounds where they had a rodeo arena they also had a baseball diamond. There were a couple soccer fields there and uh, not improved to the level that things are these days with all the manicured lawns. I mean, it was just think about a field that they mowed, <laughs> you know, and that's that was suburban Texas in the heat. Um, so, you know, the country fair was something where folks would come around from uh, throughout the county and they would watch rodeo. They'd bring their families. It was about as close as we got to a county fair in the part of the part of the state where I lived. And I don't know if it's, it's, some of your listeners won't be able to remember this, but there's a time when beer cans had pull tabs, right? And so you could actually pull the tab off. You could dunk it in the beer can. And if you were cool, you could swallow that, right? <laughs> so uh, I was not one of those kids. I was a geeky kid. But anyway, way back in those days, that was kind of recycling got started with aluminum cans. And my parents, who were both a hardworking middle-class manager kind of level people, uh, thought it'd be a good idea to help me make some money by picking up aluminum cans. And so I'd go off on my bicycle, I'd ride several miles, I'd carry a, a sack with me and I'd pick up aluminum cans if I saw them. They'd drive down the road and in the Texas heat, you know, I'd, I'd get out, they'd see cans along the side of the road. This is when people threw trash out their windows before they had the Don't Mess With Texas campaign. And I'd get in the brambles and the stickers and brave the rattlesnakes and, and grab cans, right? And I had a, a buddy that we used to do that with. Well, so this country fair comes along and there must be five or 6,000 people there and they're drinking their, you know, soda pops and their beers and it's all in cans. And so when it's over with and the, the crowd clears out, the ground is just littered with everything, including a whole bunch of tin cans. So it, it was like the Fort Knox of aluminum, right? <laughs> so my parents see that the next day and, and they get me out there bright and early in the morning. I got this sack and I'm going to town. You know, they're, they're like, okay, here's your aluminum cans. And you know, this is in the seventies. So I was, uh, I wasn't a teenager yet. You know, I didn't, I didn't have as much sense as I do now. Uh, but anyway, I, I got out there, they dropped me off and they went to run some errands. This is back when it was safe to drop kids off in public spaces. So, uh, I won't tell you what I did, but I will tell you, I picked up some cans, but the, so imagine that you're that parent, you're driving back and you see these, these fields and out in the middle of the fields, you, you see your kids sitting in a folding lawn chair holding a half empty sack of aluminum cans, swinging their feet, just kind of enjoying the day. And so my parents pull up, they're like, what, what are you doing? Like, why aren't you picking up cans? Right. Which is what I'd, I'd be saying if I was a parent, yeah. I said, I don't need to pick up cans. 
And they said, well, why not? And I said, I stuck my hand up in the air and I said, I found this. And it was a $20 bill. And, you know, with, with cans at like, I don't know, a penny a piece or something like that, that was a couple thousand cans. <laughs> and so, you know, I reasoned that I didn't need to work because I'd already found money, right? I thought the purpose of, of working was to get money. So, you know, fast forward to my fifties and I'm raising daughters and I'm getting questions like, dad, it's late at night. Uh, how hard should I study? You know, I, should I pull an A plus or should, is an A good enough? Right. Or I'm, I'm hanging on the edge of, of an A or should I go out and play with my friends or should I go to swim practice? You know, these are the things that modern parents are, we're helping our children balance. Right. And, uh, you're, you're going to get there real soon. I know. Cause it, your, your daughter and your son are, they're not quite six yet, but you'll be having these conversations. Yeah. And so the question I wrestled with them now they're in college was how much is enough? How much effort is enough? How much sweat of your brow is enough? How much heartache is enough? How much work is enough? Right. And I wrestle with that same question with the clients that we serve today, because financial planning is about making sure you have enough, enough now and enough later, kind of spreading out consumption over time. That's the point of a financial plan is to make sure that you're going to have enough. And in the lives of practicing physicians, of which we serve over 200, is the question is, how hard do I have to work? Because medicine these days is a meat grinder right? Particularly for ER docs, for docs that are in primary care. You know, it's the ob guy who's catching babies overnight, wondering when she's going to be able to be at a home with her own kids. Uh, it's difficult. And, and so I feel like the thing that, that we do in my business is help people figure out how much is enough. And before I had it beat out of me, pushed out of me, cajoled out of me, I used to know how much was enough. And I think that we all are born knowing how much is enough, but culture makes it such that we we lose that we make some agreements as we as we grow and we age and we strive and we reach that makes it hard to know how much is enough yeah it's i mean it's a great point in and often you know we have a lot of hustle culture and and and, and i think what the the way i see is we're we're having almost like a, <laughs> a generational battle between, uh, you know, sort of the, the older generations that are in that sort of hustle culture versus the younger generations that have almost rebelled against it. And I think it's probably somewhere in the middle, but mm -hmm. when you are working with clients and you're talking about, you know, kind of how much is enough and what is that, what, what, what does that mean? Do you mean how much is enough money? How much is enough? Maybe expand on what you mean by enough, because I think maybe that means something different to different people. Yeah. Ultimately it all comes back to time because time is the resource that we're born with a certain amount of that we can't restore. You know, whereas if you lose money, you can get money back or if you spend it, you can get some more, but it comes back to time, but the translator is always money. Okay. So, um, specific examples is a hospitalist who says, you know, uh, I have room to work more shifts, but, but I'm tired and I don't want to work those shifts unless I really need to. So how much do I really need to be saving to be able to be on track for my retirement at, you know, whatever date they choose, 55, 60, 65, whatever it happens to be. And, you know, through math, we can say, well, okay, if you uh, invest and you get this rate of return and you save this amount of money then you are likely to have this outcome. You're likely to not run out of money if you retire at this given age with all these assumptions, right? So you build a model. It's, it's basically a spreadsheet run through software. And then you can ask the question, well, if that's not enough, how many more shifts do I have to work and how much do I have to save out of those shifts? Or sometimes we find out that, you know, they're, they're doing well and that they're overshooting the goal. And that allows them to cut back the amount of shifts that they work and to be able to spend time doing whatever they want to do it. Uh, not the least of which is getting some sleep, right? Because after you've been on shift for a while, it, it's hard to sleep. Yeah. Yeah, that's, certainly. That's exactly, that's exactly how the strategy works back in a tactics, which comes right down to the bottom line of life. Yeah. And I, I'm so glad you said that, you know, ultimately it comes down to time. And that's, that's been 
a big realization for myself since I had kids is just that, yeah, uh, like money, money is the tool to, to get that time, but, but it's not what I want. I don't want, a, <laughs> I don't want a, a, you know, a pot of gold, a sack of money. Like it doesn't, that's not really the goal. The goal is to, to, to create time for myself to spend with my family. And then, and then I guess expanding that out is the same thing, you know, sort of creating that same scenario for our investors. So I think right. um, the, the fact that you said that is, it really, um, I resonate, it resonates with me. And so when you're calculating those I, it, it, in, in so much of it's, it's sounds simplified, but, but it's true. So much of, of freeing up your time does come down to math mm -hmm. <laughs> ultimately whether that's math related to money or math related to hours or or you know some combination of both with you're working with physicians i i'm a veterinarian i know a lot of my listeners my friends are are veterinarians we we know we know burnout well um what do you think where do you start that conversation? I guess so. You're you're just saying, you're asking people, at what age do you want to retire? Is that kind of the idea, or what's your? How yep. do you, where do you start with that? Yeah, that's the ultra basic. So, um, you know, you may have heard financial planning is a process, right? But most people who go to an advisor are going to get a financial plan if they're going to get one at all, and it's going to be used as a sales tool. It's going to be a way for that person to gather some assets and ring up the one percent and you know, the whole thing. Right. So, um, but really financial planning when it's done correctly is done like business planning where you shoot your business plan, you roll forward a period or two, you reshoot your business plan based on what you've learned in the prior period and adjustments you can make and situational awareness, which is how we run personal financial planning. And that kind of personal financial planning is hard. Uh, it's, it's hard because you need an accountability partner. That's the first thing that makes it hard. And the second thing is the math changes, right? So knowing which variables to focus on, that kind of stuff. I'm not saying it's impossible. And I'm certainly not saying it's something that a physician could not grasp because they do things that are far more difficult than this. But I think that, uh, you know, individual change, anybody who's tried to lose weight or grow muscle or anything that's personal change, it's always easier if you have an accountability partner, whether that's your spouse kicking your ass or it is, uh, you know, a trainer who's pushing you or a business coach. Uh, it's always easier with accountability. So, but yeah, iterative process begins with the question. Everybody's got to stop working someday, even if it's just stop working right before you have your last breath, right? So uh, the, the question is always, when do you want to retire? In fact, that's, that's the number one thing that people approach us about, right? And, and even when you did your, your spreadsheet on a couple podcasts ago where you're answering Logan's question about becoming a billionaire, I mean, you were looking at when he was 55, when he was 60 years old and how much he would have then, whether or not it would be enough. So even, even we're talking about a five-year-old who's just right on the edge of math acquisition, yeah. uh, we're still talking about retirement, right? right. So. Um, yeah, it begins there. So the question is, when do you want to retire? And there's a whole lot that goes into answering that question. You know, you don't have to know the answer to that when you're working with a skilled financial advisor. They should be able to ask you questions to be able to really get at the, at the meat of it. But it starts there, and then it gets elaborated into, okay, so let's say you want to retire when you're 60. Okay, but what does that look like? You know, how much money do you need to spend to support yourself when you're 60 at, at a basic level and then maybe at an enhanced level, you know? Um, so when you retire in your 60, you just want to sit on your keister or do you want to travel? Well, almost all of our clients say they want to travel. And so you can express that as a major purchase goal. I don't know anybody who wants to retire in the United States without having healthcare support. So there's always a healthcare support goal that goes in it. Um, sometimes uh, fathers or daughters like myself, you want to be able to include a wedding. Uh, you might want a house down payment. There's all kinds of things that go into just the, I'm raising air quotes for you listeners with, with your headphones on that, uh, you know, is a retirement goal can be actually a set of goals such that in, in our shop, we don't call it a retirement goal. We call it an aim. And an aim is a package of goals that unfold over the course of a lifetime. So, you know, have I scratched the surface with you here on, on just retirement? Because there's, there's more. No, I, I think that's a great description. And I think it's funny, you, you just <laughs> completely uh, 
really made me rethink that whole thing or not rethink, but, you know, you mentioned that, that, um, podcast about Logan and, and, um, I, it, I didn't even consciously think about this, but yes, I put it at, you know, 60 years, 65, whatever, probably because that's the traditional retirement age, but it's, it's, yeah. I didn't even occur to me until you just said it, that that is, that that influenced that, um, <laughs> that actual, I guess, number. And, um, it's for folks who didn't, don't know what we're talking about. I, I you know, there's a podcast episode where I made, uh, a, essentially a spreadsheet describing the, the, the value of, of investments over time and how that applies to my kids. But, uh, re really a great point there that, you know, even, even though he's, he's five, we're talking about a retirement. You're one of the things you bring up is, you know, why early retirement isn't the solution to your burnout. Mm -hmm. I, I think I have a sense of why, of what that means, but maybe, maybe speak to that a little bit. Well, so I can't say that I believe in retirement. I'm not, I'm not a big believer. Um, I believe in doing the thing that lights you up. I believe in, in following your energy, right? Which is kind of a, a crazy way of just saying, you know, you, you figure out what you like and you keep doing that until you don't like it anymore. And then you do something else. Right. So, um, I have seen people that are retired and they're miserable, right? Mm -hmm. And I've seen people who've, uh, who worked in miserable. And I, I've seen a lot of people who are working that are really happy. I mean, the, the folks that we work with are typically, you know, surgeons and ob guys and psychiatrists that are 40 plus, right? They've already got their house. They've got their student loans under, under thumb. Uh, they are beginning to wonder like what else, what else there is, right? So feel like I'm getting away from the, the question that you asked. You may have to reprompt me here. Um, but I, I believe in work. <laughs> yeah. And even though I was that kid who was sitting on his can, not picking up cans, you know, I do believe in work. I've, I found that, you know, mirroring the work ethic that my parents gave me, I really like working because I, I believe in what I do. Uh, you know, this is the know your why podcast. And I told you in my intro notes, that my why is knowing that I'm doing the right thing. Right. I want to always know that I'm doing the right thing, not just for, you know, my family and myself and my clients, but in the world. Right. I, I want to know that as I'm breathing and I'm acting, that I'm making a difference in the things that I'm doing. And it doesn't have to be a huge difference, but it has to be some difference. At the end of the day, I want to feel like I've left the, the place better off than when I found it. Right. And this is just the thing that I've I've found that that I do well. So. I'm sure I got off the topic of the question. Oh, how, how does that relate to fire? Okay. So here's how it relates to fire. Um, I'm okay with the five part of fire. You know, on our podcast, uh, I think it was the second or third show we talked about fire, you know, should physicians set themselves on fire was the topic of the podcast. And my answer is no. Um, in order to retire early as a physician, you have to work extra hard as a physician, right? You have to save more money than if you were never going to retire, which we've also done a podcast about never retiring. And I can talk about that too. So you have to work extra hard. And, and here's the rub. You know, the people that we serve have kids, just like you've got kids, you've got families. Your son, you told me, is about five. Do you say he's turning six soon? Uh, he, he's about five and a half. Uh, yeah, okay. turning three soon. Right. So I've done the math on this, and I calculated that from the time that my daughters are born until the time they turn six, I had spent more time with them up to that point than I would ever spend with them in the rest of their lives, which is to say, if I count the hours between the time that they were born and the time that they went off to school, I will never spend that much time with them again. And we all know that as investors, the most valuable dollar that you invest is the first dollar that you invest because it has the longest number of compounding periods, right? It's got the most doubling periods. But it just so happens that if you're out there trying to get that almighty dollar, you might not be in a position where you're going to see your child say bird for the first time or take their first steps or crawl, right? And, and I got to see all those things. I got to see all those things. I, I work from home. I didn't grow my practice until my kids were, were ready for it, right? So that put me behind. But, you know, I'm not all about the money. I value life because life is short. I've seen people die. I've survived the suicides of three 
physicians of which I had direct contact, right? I know it's short. Uh, you mentioned veterinary suicide. I know it's a big deal. We don't know when we're going to go. We just know roughly how much time we have. And so even though money's easily measurable, money's not the measure of a good life. The measure of a good life is how people feel after we're gone. Were they happy that we're here? Or are they happy that we're gone, right? It's how you treat it. And Maya Angelou said something like, people are not going to remember what you did for them or what you said to them. They're just going to remember how you made them feel. It's so true. And, and, uh, <laughs> when you say that, that you've already, you spent more time with them, you know, by the time they're six than you will in the rest of their lives, two things like makes me a little sad to think yeah. that, you know, my son's, my son's almost there, but, but secondly, it makes me say, nope, I'm proving that wrong. It, it makes me say, I'm going to, I'm going to, I want to change that. Like I, I believe you, but mm -hmm. that, that just gives me another goal to say, I, I want to, I want to, you know, do something so that that's not the case that I'm, that we're still, uh, close as, as they age. So, um, but I certainly, the, the point makes a lot of sense And I guess back in reference, Ben, to the, to the, or, or remember the, just a second here, hold on. This is not an hour none proposition. You yeah. don't have to prove that wrong. Okay. Mm -hmm. My point about that is that it's okay to not save as much when your kids are that age. It's okay to spend time with your family rather than stacking up the Benjamins. And it's okay to not retire early. It's okay to work. It's okay to be a vet for the rest of your life if that's what you choose. Yeah. And, you know, we're, we're in this hustle economy, the side gig economy, where I read on the internet that doctors are supposed to do everything that they're supposed to do in addition to being doctors. And let's face it, some of these doctors are mothers. And they work a hell of a lot harder than the fathers do in their households, right? And they're being told to do things that are side hustles as well. I'm just saying to your audience, it's okay to just be a doctor. Yeah. It's okay <laughs> to spend time with your family. And it's okay to spend money for the sake of doing so. You don't have to retire early. Yeah. Being a parent is, is a, maybe the, the hardest side hustle there is. <laughs> it's a... Wow, that is so. I hope somebody is following you and putting this on on uh, a Twitter. I'm not going to say the new name of it. Twitter. I think yeah. that's a totally quotable moment. Being a yeah. parent is the hardest side hustle. Ever. It's, I love probably, it. Probably, probably so true. My <laughs> certainly, uh, I, I see my my wife working very, very hard at it. And but, don't worry, it only gets worse. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The more opinions they get, the more uh, the more fun it gets. Yeah, but you're. Yeah, the, the not having to retire and not having to retire early is it's a it's a great point. And I, and I think the burnout often come, you know, so many people that especially in the medical space, like physicians, veterinarians, dentists, people that it, it's it you go into that oftentimes because it's your passion, right? Like, I, mm -hmm. I, yes, people say become a doctor because you make money. But like, I don't like most doctors, that is not sort of the driving force behind it. People know that doctors yes. can make some money, but they leave out the fact that most of them have, you know, tremendous amount of student debt. They work yeah. long, long hours, train for many, many years, sometimes Correct. decades at much below, <laughs> much below living wage. So it all, all of that gets, gets set aside when it, when people say, yeah, go, go become a doctor. Cause you'll, you'll make lots of money. Um, but the, but the point is, and, and I, want to touch on this because I, I experienced it myself is I, I love doing surgery. I, I love it. I really enjoy being in the OR. It, it's something that, that I, I actually believe I'm good at. And, and, it, and I like, you know, that environment is a, is a, is a safe space, whatever, whatever the word you want to use. Like so, mm -hmm. it's a place I enjoy being. The, it's a zone of competence. Yeah. It's a place where you're good. That's a much better. Yeah. <laughs> that's a much better way to put it. Yeah. But, but there was a time where I did feel burnt out and I, and I had felt that I had stopped enjoying it and that it became very much a job. And so I had to adjust the, how it looked for me. I had to, I had to, yep. I didn't leave, I didn't leave veterinary surgery. I changed what it, what it meant in my life and how to, how to make it something that I still um, could enjoy and be passionate about and not have it consume my life. And I think that, that, you know, that's how I take what you're, what you say when, you know, you say early retirement isn't the solution to your burnout because that's correct. 
I don't yeah. really want to stop doing surgery. Yeah, I don't, no, I don't have imagine, this, like... <laughs> imagine for a moment though, okay, that you're you're that that burning out surgeon, okay, and you don't have the wherewithal that you have today. You don't have the financial acumen that you have today. You don't have the high level of awareness that you have. To, you strike me as a person who's very self aware, okay. It's difficult for a person who's in that situation to realize that there is a way out. And yeah. a lot of the things that keeps physicians pinned into these situations is something financial. It could be a belief about finances that's self-limiting. It could be a, a an obstacle that appears to be something permanent that they can't get over. Can I give you an example of, of this? Of course. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So um, I serve a, a couple that are both surgeons and they had a child and uh, they moved to a state that was a lower cost of living. They had a paid off house and they, they had the college fund all set up for one child. And um, the, one of the spouses came to me and said, you know, my, my, my wife and I are interested in having another child. She's not comfortable having another child because we have these student loans. And I just, I just don't know what to do. I don't know if it's going to be right for us or not. And so we talked about having kids and like, is that the right thing for them to do? And ultimately they came to their own decision because that's like, baby planning is not what we do. But uh, it seemed like it was the right decision for them. He's like, well, there's just the student loan debt. She wouldn't feel comfortable scaling back her practice enough to be able to have another child. We don't want to just have a nanny raise our child the whole time. Okay. Yeah. So I said, well, let's look at this. Very simple. Very simple. I looked at the balance sheet and I said, you have a taxable account here with money in it that is more than enough to be able to pay off those student loans. He said, yes, but I'll owe capital gains tax and I'll extinguish a low rate loan. And I said, sure, that's the case. But we calculated what the capital gains tax amount would be. And we calculated what the give up would be in paying off a low rate student debt. And it was some small number, like it was $20,000, which is not small potatoes for everyone, but for a double physician family, both surgeons, that's small potatoes. Mm -hmm. I said, so in, in one hand, I'm holding my, up my hands for your audio listeners. In one hand, you hold a check for $20,000. In the other hand, you hold the life of a child. Which one of these is the choice that you're going to make? And in their case, it was super easy. Well, 20 grand plus the cost of a nanny to be able to have a child, no big deal. And so they made that decision. And it's super simple. I mean, that's not high level. Uh, you could probably put that out there on Reddit and ask that question. But they just happened to turn to us for that question. And over the course of an hour conversation, I said, this, this to me is the math. This is the way to see it. And so it was simply having outside perspective, being able to see their circumstances in a way that they had not seen it is, is the value. It's not, you know, in our case, it's not beating the S&P 500 or getting some huge tax break. In, in that case, it was just giving that person permission to spend money as a way of improving their quality of life and seeing beyond just the dollars and cents. It all, it all ties in together. And it's, it's not, at the, like you said earlier, it, it, ultimately the, the, the goal or the you know, ultimate prize is, is time. And so if your time is sacrifice, you're sacrificing time, whether that's with a child or whatever it is, to, you know, fulfill some, some unwritten rule that you think should be followed, what, you know, whether that's around debt or, or spending money or investing or whatever, you really do have to look at it from, from what, what does your, you know, what, what, what makes your life, what structures your life the way that you want it to be. And, um, I think that's a, a perfect example of something like that, where people do get kind of stuck in their own heads about, oh, here's this student loan or here's this whatever. And it's just right. um, not necessarily. This online source says I shouldn't pay capital gains. This online source says I should always have the lowest, the lowest interest rate on my loans. This online source says I should retire early. But the dynamics of my family, the thing, the values that I grew up with, my lived experience, the thing that I know in my heart, all says this is the right thing to do. Right. So at, at the end of the podcast uh, that Nate and I put together, the thing that I always go out with is remember, you're not making a living. You're making a life. Money is just the it's just the fuel that makes that life go. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I think sometimes it does take that, you know, you mentioned accountability partner. It, it does sometimes take that outside view 
mm-hmm. to recognize like <laughs> have someone else do the math for you and you know you still get to decide what's important to you but sometimes yeah. you're just not you're you're seeing something as this obstacle and it's really maybe not the obstacle that you thought it was i I don't, this is another example that, you, you know, student, student loans, I, I have oh know, a lot of vets have high student loans. And so it's a yeah. big thing, big source of topic. And I see, you know, there's, there's, whether you, whether you believe in student loan forgiveness or not, there are certain programs where, you know, after you've been paying for 20 or 25 years, you, you get forgiven what's left. Right. And I've seen a lot of people like, worrying about they gave it this name called tax bomb and yep. they're, they're worried about the fact that they're gonna have to pay taxes on free money mm-hmm. and i'm like that's not a problem right <laughs> that is that is not a real problem if if you get a hundred thousand dollars forgiven off a of debt but you have to pay 20 or thirty thousand to have that happen that's well spent money. Like that's not a thing that should be upsetting to people. And I think it just, sometimes it's just getting, um, getting a handle around, you know, what those numbers and maybe don't call it a tax bomb because that, (laughs) that makes it sound terrible, but there's just pieces of, of information that I think are, are are missing and, and, um, sometimes take someone else to to put all those puzzle pieces Student loans are tricky. They're really tricky. Um, You know, I have a specialist on my team that that looks at student loans. And lately, you know, our administration has has changed the rules in a pretty rapid way. And I'm not complaining about that. There's no slam on the administration. But the fact of the matter is the rules are changing. It's really hard to tell, you know, what is the right thing to do right now. And because of the rate of change, you also have to question, you know, what's going to be the right thing 10 years from now, did I, am I screwing something up today or am I making the right decision? And I think the only thing you can do about that is to backstop your decision by l- looking at the other things you do in your finances. I mean, a hundred thousand dollar tax bomb 25 years from now is no big deal. If you've got a fistful of real estate, you could liquidate and, you know, meet that tax bomb at the, at the time, right? Nobody cares about that. If you've, if you've got a large enough blast shield to put around your tax bomb, just bring it on. Right. right. I, I feel sad for those where, you know, the 25 year debt relief is not a tactic for them. It's their only hope. And then they get a tax bomb. You know, they're, they're, they're having trouble getting to that point. But I think that, you know, at some point you, you have to be self-responsible because you did take on the debt. And even if there is tax relief there, and even if it does come with a huge tax bill, at some point you have to wake up and go, I'm going to take control of my personal finances. And that's what your show is about. That's what my show is about. That's what our work is about, you know? So if you're hearing this, then, then you've already got hope. <laughs> you can just look at that as like a, uh, I don't know, a tax, a tax speed bomb rather than a tax bomb. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's uh, a great point there about you do, at some point you do have to take some, some responsibility of, of, of just educating yourself and, and seeing what the options are. And, and, you know, we mentioned, you mentioned before we started recording that, that you don't really deal with real estate and I don't, I yeah. don't care how people I like, I like real estate. That's my vehicle. Cause I understand it. And I've been yeah. doing it since I was a teenager. Like I understand how that stuff works, but the, but you just have to do something. You have to, yeah. you have to have some, take some ownership and have some, some level of, um, you know, investment, not, I don't mean that financially, I mean, time, education, whatever it is, some level of investment in figuring out how to, uh, better your own financial future and right you know if if you need help then then there are people here for that ben's here for that i'm here to help like there's people here to help with those things and get you on the right track but but at some point too you just gotta you do have to decide that that that's a priority for you if i'm translating this for you what you're saying is that uh if you are if you have watched an hour of television in the last week then you have the potential to become a millionaire by reinvesting that hour in yourself and figuring out what to do with your finances. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's absolutely true. Yeah, and, and no, no slam on social, but uh, that's that's what a lot of us spend doing while we're waiting for our kids to get out of a baseball game, or when we're trying to go to sleep at night, or sometimes when we wake up in the morning, we'll go to social or we'll go to television. You know, there are all kinds of things that we do where you know we could use that time to improve ourselves. And again, there's there's an enough to that as well. You, right. you can 
you can learn everything you need to know about investing at some point and stop learning. It doesn't have to be a career for you. Um, but you do have to know, I mean, this is, this is part of growing up in the United States. This is just the way our economy runs. You, you have to understand these things if you're going to have control over your, your own freedom. Yeah. A hundred percent agree. hundred percent agree. I think, um, that that's, that's a, actually probably a really good <laughs> message to start, um, start wrapping up here. And then I have, I've a set of questions. I like to ask every guest, you, you already touched on your why. Um, and, and I, I really, I really like what you said, um, about, you know, sort of just wanting to do the right thing. And I think that mm -hmm. that's a very good, <laughs> A very good perspective to just kind of live by in general is like you know as you make decisions what 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 makes me feel like i'm doing the right thing and and that may be it may correlate with with your um message about you know not getting burnt out and what is enough and all of that i, I just think um mm. really being self-aware and, and answering those questions for yourself is, is 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 a big part of that journey right when people hear this and they want to reach out to you, what, what's the best way? What's the best way to connect? Yeah. So the name of my firm is Physician Family Financial Advisors. We serve physicians with kids. If you don't have kids, don't contact us because we'll say no. It's really, it's physicians with kids. We're passionate about kids. Um, most of our clients are, you know, like I say, they're established, their 40s and up. Um, you know, we don't have a minimum portfolio size, but we do charge a level monthly membership fee. And that would indicate a portfolio of, I don't know, quarter mil, half million dollars, which for many physicians in their 40s, they've just got that much in their 401k, right? So um, so name of the firm, Physician Family Financial Advisors. Uh, you can find us at physicianfamily.com. And a shock and awe moment here, folks. The name of our podcast is Physician Family Financial Advisors Podcast. Yeah. And we'll, we'll put all that in, uh, into the show notes, but seems, yeah. seems like it should be easy to find. I, I, I like the keeping the consistent messaging there. That's a good idea. Um, what piece of advice would you give to people that are, the question I was is what, what advice would you give to someone starting? And I think in the context of what we've discussed here, if someone hears this, and and they they sort of take that message of yes I do need to take some of that accountability and um you know on on myself and I I do want to kind of uh, look at my financial future and and change my position what what would you tell them as some first steps to get started towards that uh, I would tell them to keep listening to your podcast and and poke other financial podcasts in their in their player because you you have to have someone standing on your shoulder being Jiminy Cricket telling you the right thing to do. You have to keep your head in the game. So that's the first step. If we're really starting at square zero, first thing is to build an emergency fund with a grand in it, then maybe an emergency fund with 10 grand in it. So if your car breaks down, you don't have to undo everything. Okay. Once you have your emergency fund, as you continue to educate yourself about investing, you want to get the, the most out of your 401k. You want to get the free money. So get the match. Uh, beyond that, if I had extra money, I'd start putting into my health savings account because you're going to get a great tax deduction there. And if you had to, you could raid your HSA for an emergency. Um, yeah, I think beyond that, it's really getting into the real estate market, you know, get on the housing ladder, scrape up your down, do whatever you have to, to get into the right home at the right time. Don't buy too much. And, uh, you know, once you've done all that stuff, come see us because then the real fun begins. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, Ben, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Uh, I really enjoyed the conversation and I think, Same. um, a lot of, a lot of value for listeners. So thank you so much for, for being here today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And folks listening, uh, you're definitely going to want to, want to check out Ben's podcast and, and, you know, kind of what, what they're doing, especially if you are, uh, physicians with children, uh, definitely, um, an important niche with, with a lot of need there. Um, but please like rate and review the show so we can get more great guests like Ben and thank you for listening. Hey there, I am Dr. Jason Ballara, and this is the Know Your Why podcast, where we explore the why behind success. Every week, I meet with real estate investors, veterinary entrepreneurs, mindset coaches, authors, and fitness professionals to uncover their why and how it drives them on the winding road to success. What is your why?